the purpose of God giving you abilities is not for you to indulge in yourself. It's not for you to glory in yourself. It is to bring glory to God by serving one another. What's the message today? Make your life come. Turn to your neighbor, tell your neighbor, make your life come. You know, I have this nice picture of a sun castle. How many of you have tried building something in the sun? Is this a nice sun castle, yes or no? Yes. Some of us, that's exactly what you're doing with your life. You are building sun castle. What happens after 12 hours when the tide will come? Well, this is what's going to happen. When the tide will come, what will happen to your sun castle? It will be destroyed. It will disappear sooner or later. And many of us are spending our lives, our time, building sun castles. You don't realize that in reality, whatever effort you are putting into will sooner or later disappear. That's why make your life count is very meaningful for all of us. Young people today, they want to make their life count. Do you know young people today, they're engaged in many activities, especially when it comes to, in their mind, making the world better. Example, climate change. Social engagement on justice. The idea of the walk, equity. All of these young people are passionate. They want to do something. Without realizing all of those things will not solve the problem of the world. The problem of the world is so basic. It has to do with the hearts of people. This world will not be better until the hearts of men are changed. Make your life count. The question is, how do you do it? The Apostle Paul gives us three principles on how to make your life count. Today we will discuss the importance of the Holy Spirit. Next week, we will talk about love. To make your life count, you better understand what love is. And then the next chapter, you need to know your priorities. And then the next chapter has to do with eternal perspective. But today, I want us to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let us read. Everybody together. Now concerning spiritual gifts. Literally, in the original Bible, the word is simply spirituals. Regarding spirituals, spiritual things. Because the Corinthians were very carnal. They were very fleshly. Lots of quarreling. It's all about themselves. And now Paul is saying, I want to switch your mind regarding spiritual things. Nothing wrong with the word gifts because the context has to do with spiritual gifts. Brethren, believers, I do not want you to be unaware. In other words, don't be ignorant because ignorant can be costly. Many today, many people today are ignorant of God's truth and they don't miss it because they are ignorant. The problem with ignorance, it can be costly and you don't even know it's going to cost you. So the Bible is saying, don't be ignorant. So what should you not be ignorant about? Notice verse 2. You know when you were pagans, you were led astray to the mute idols, however you were led. What the Bible is saying is once upon a time, we have a life that is not worshiping God. We were worshiping idols. If you look at your life, all of us today, whether you like it or not, before coming to Christ, you are not worshiping God. God is not your priority. Your priority is yourself. Yes or no? Because you are not worshiping the true God. We are idol worshipers. The only difference is this. Your idols today may not be made of stone. It may not be made of gold. But it can be something in your heart. So that's what Paul is saying. Once upon a time, you were led astray. You were led astray to the mute idols, however you were led. But then something happened. You met Jesus. 
Let's read together. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is a curse. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. He's now saying the day that your life was transformed to make it significant, to make it significant, is the day you encounter Jesus. When you have the Holy Spirit, something happens. What happens? You are able to recognize Jesus is Lord. He is not saying superficially, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. What is he saying? People today who are not even believers can mouth Jesus is Lord. Are you aware of that? So what does it mean? Without the Holy Spirit, you cannot really say Jesus is Lord. Well, let me share with you. Matthew chapter 7 tells us, everybody read. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Who alone can really make you submit to the Lordship of Jesus? The Holy Spirit. On my own, I will never submit to the Lordship of Jesus. I will be a counterfeit believer. Only the Holy Spirit can change my heart. That's why the Bible says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. I want to ask you a question that only you can answer. Is Jesus your Lord? See, Jesus is not your Lord if you don't obey him. That's why Luke tells us, this is from the mouth of Jesus. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? God is talking to all of us today. You need his Holy Spirit to transform your heart so that you can recognize him as Lord. Not just in your mouth, in your life. So principle number one, if you want to make your life count, what must you do? Abide. Submit. Be dependent on the Holy Spirit. What do I mean? What the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, why you need the Holy Spirit? You will receive, everybody read, you receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You see, I need the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome temptation. I need the Holy Spirit to give me wisdom. I need the Holy Spirit to live a life that's pleasing to God. Notice, the Bible tells us the importance of the Holy Spirit in John 15, verses four and five. Do you mind reading John 15, verse four and five? This is a command. Abide, everybody read, abide in me. It's a command. What does it mean to abide? As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. So what is the picture of the branch and the vine? It's a picture of intimacy, a picture of relationship. You cannot bear fruit if you don't get sustenance from the main uh, vine, all right? I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides, he who depends upon me, intimate with me, dependent upon me, and I in him, he, everybody read, he bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do, you can do what, something? You can do nothing. So principle number one, if you want to make your life count, say, say the word abide. Abide means to be dependent on the Holy Spirit. Question, do you have the Holy Spirit? Ah, who is the Holy Spirit? Let's look at Romans chapter eight, verse nine. Everybody read this together. However, you are not in the flesh, controlled by the flesh, but in the Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit. 
if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. So the Holy Spirit is also called the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is also called the Spirit of Christ. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. According to this verse, who is a Christian? According to that verse, who is a Christian? Good morning. According to this verse, who is a real Christian? If anyone does not have the spirit of Christ. It does not say, if anyone does not go to CCF, if anyone does not belong to this religion, no, no. If you have Christ, you have the Holy Spirit, you are a child of God. So let me ask you, how many of you have the Holy Spirit in your heart? Raise your hand. You know, my question to you is this. Do you have the Holy Spirit? You did not raise your hand? Are you a part of the choir? All right, one more time. Do you have the Holy Spirit? Raise your hand. Okay, I thought your hands were... People don't realize God gave me an amazing eyes, amazing eyes to see what you guys are up to, okay? Now, don't raise your hand because I'm watching you. You know why? God knows your heart. Yes or no? So one more time, sincerely, don't raise your hand anymore. Do you have the spirit of Christ in you? If your answer is yes, my next question, what's the evidence? You see, do you have the fruit of the Holy Spirit? The fruit of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. The evidence of the Holy Spirit in your life is a transformed life. A new desire to study the Bible. A new desire to worship God. A desire to submit to the Lord. That comes from the inside. It is never imposed. So how do you make your life count? Number one, louder, abide. Meaning you be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Do you realize that is something that I pray all of us will be controlled by the Holy Spirit. You know why? That is how the world will see the reality of Christ. Do you know in Daniel chapter five, let's read. What was Daniel known for? People can see the Holy Spirit in his life. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is a spirit of the holy gods. In the days of your father, illumination, insight, wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And Nebuchadnezzar, your father, the king, appointed him chief of the magicians. This was because an extraordinary spirit, knowledge, insight, was found in this Daniel. The unbelievers saw the spirit Spirit of God in the life of Daniel, but they do not know how to call it, okay? They just say spirit of the gods. But actually, it is the Holy Spirit in the life of Daniel. My prayer is when God looks at you, when your friends look at you, when your children look at you, they will see the Spirit of God in the way you work, in the way you manage, in the way you do things at home and in the office. Number two, appropriate. It's one thing to have God giving you his resources, but it's another thing for you to know. It's, it's another thing for you to avail of it. I'm reminded of the story of a man who saved his money to travel from Europe, from London to New York. Now, you have to understand, years ago, there's no airplane. It's only by boat. And it will take probably 10 days to sail from London to New York. So this guy, saved his money, was so happy, he boarded the, the boat. Now, there was a distinguished gentleman, and he's sensitive to people. He noticed this guy 
does not eat in the dining room. So when he walks around the boat, he will see this guy eating, you know, bread, uh, crackers. I don't know if it's sky flakes or not, but at that time they have no sky flakes, okay? So the guy asked him, sir, why are you not eating with us? You know what this man said? I don't have the money. So the gentleman said, do you have a ticket? Can I see your ticket? He said, the moment you got a ticket, food is included. Breakfast, lunch, dinner. But this guy was eating stale bread. Why? He does not know. And because he does not know, he does not know how to appropriate the provisions. There are many Christians today, you have the Holy Spirit in your life, but you don't know how to appropriate. So you are journeying the Christian life like a spiritual pauper. You are spiritually poor. There is no joy. Why? Because you are living the Christian life in your own power. You are ignorant of what God wants you to experience. And that's why you need to understand theology. God not just save you. He saved you that you may live meaningful, purposeful, joyful life. It is not meant for you to be happy the day you die. God wants you to live an amazing life now. It does not mean there's no problem, but it's a life of purpose, meaning. Make your life count. Principle number one, abide, depend on him. Principle number two, appropriate by faith. And that is what I want you to see how God has given us his gift. Let's read together. He emphasizes the following. There are varieties of gifts. The emphasis is varieties. Many kinds of gifts. That's where you have the word charismata. That's where you have the word charismatics. The emphasis is on the gift of the Holy Spirit. But the same Spirit. Many varieties of ministries. You see, the gift of God determines the ministries he will give you. But the same Lord. Varieties of effects, the outcome of your ministry, many, many results. However, you have the same God who works all things in all person. Do you notice the Trinity? The Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus, and God. They are all at work in providing for you gifts. What's the purpose of the gift? Power, abilities to live the Christian life in service. And that's why it says, each, everybody read this. Each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. And that's why alignment is important. You must not just appropriate, you have to align God's purpose for your life. Spiritual gifts, everybody read, are special God-given abilities for service to build up the body of Christ. It's given by God freely. The definition includes the source of the gift, Holy Spirit. The meaning of the gifts, special abilities. All of you have special abilities. Purpose is to serve him. So he now gives examples of the gifts. What are the examples of the gift? Let's read. To one is given the word of wisdom through the spirit. Notice the emphasis, spirit. To another, the word of knowledge. Emphasis, same spirit. To another, faith, same spirit. To another, gifts of healing, one spirit. To another, effecting of miracles. To another, prophecy. By the way, prophecy here is not about always talking about the future. It is the message of God that he wants you to have. That is explained in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. So you come, chapter 14. 
to another, various kinds of tongues, and to another, interpretation of tongues. This is the elephant in the room, the gift of tongues. We will expand that some more in chapter 14. In the meantime, I want you to know, these are all the gifts, but are these complete lists? No. Why, what do I mean? One and the same spirit works, everybody read this, this is very important for you to know. One and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually, just as he wills. In short, everybody has a gift. Are you aware of that? How many of you are fully aware of God's gift to you? You know your special gift. Raise your hand. Don't be shy. So you know God's gift. You know your abilities. Before the session is over, I'm gonna help you understand the gift. In the meantime, I want you to notice something. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28, notice about this gift. This gift is now offices. From gift abilities, they become offices. Example, God has appointed in the church apostles, prophets, teachers, miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administration, various kinds of tongues, now, everybody, the emphasis is this. All kinds of gifts, all are not apostles. The emphasis, we all do not have the same gift. All, everybody read, all are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, are they? Grammatically, the emphasis is, of course not. Of course not, because there are people who want to insist that you must have this gift, you must have this gift. No, no, the Bible says all of us have different gifts. Don't be proud. At the same time, don't compare. Don't judge. Don't compete. The gifts are given to complement, not to compete. The gift of the Holy Spirit is a stewardship issue. What do I mean? First Peter chapter four. Everybody read. Each one has received a special gift. All of you have a special gift, each one. What must you do? Employ it in serving one another. You are to use it, you got to be aligned. God gave us gift to serve one another as good stewards. So if you are not using your God-given gifts, you are neglecting what God has given you. And that, my friend, is wrong. There is no such thing as a Lone Ranger Christian. It is always in the context of a local body, a church, helping one another. That's why Peter is very clear. Whoever speaks, you speak as one who is speaking the utterance of God. Whoever serves, you must serve as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies. In other words, everything you do is empowered by God so that all things God may be glorified through Jesus. The whole purpose of the gift is to bring glory to God and to build up one another. God has given you special skills. This is different from natural abilities. Natural abilities is from God. But once you come to Christ, He will expand your gift. It can be expanding the natural abilities or it can be other gifts. But everything is given by the Holy Spirit for you to serve. Now, what is the elephant in the room? The elephant in the room is simply this. Look at this chart. The gift of tongues, gift of healings. On one extreme, people are saying, the gift of tongues, everything, has ceased. You have sincere believers. They believe it has stopped. Even though, I will tell you <clears throat> our position from history and from scripture. Another extreme, you need to speak in tongues. 
Because if you don't speak in tongues, you don't have the Holy Spirit. These are all wrong. Because the Bible is very clear, we all don't have the same gift. So why do we impose on others the gift that we want them to have? Are you clear? So no jealousy, no envy. What's the balance? You will learn this in chapter 14. Do not prohibit people from speaking in tongues. Do it orderly with interpreter. If there's no interpreter, the Bible says, keep quiet. And the purpose of the gift is not for show. It is not to impress people. It is to build others. So, question. I've learned that there are amazing gifts that God has given us, and you and I should not put God in a box. I have learned not to put God in a box. You need to learn that God works in mysterious ways. One of my friends, he's a tobacco farmer in South Africa. His business is growing tobacco. He met Jesus on his own, reading the New Testament. And he said, hmm, I should stop tobacco business. As he read the Bible, he read about Jesus healing the sick. So he decided, I will copy Jesus. So, so this guy is a white African. So his workers are all blacks. So he gathered them. I will teach you the Bible. And then at the end, he decided to pray. If you are sick, you come. I'm going to pray for you. Okay, I mean, this guy is a new Christian. And then he would pray for the sick. But then one day they brought somebody with a wheelchair. Now he will pray for people who have fever, who have cold, but with a wheelchair he will not pray because he does not know what will happen if he pray for the guy with the wheelchair. You know what happened? That guy with the wheelchair will not move. He kept bugging him. Pray for me, pray for me. So finally he prayed for the wheelchair. In his mind, nothing will happen. Okay, he prayed for him. Then he started praying for the others. And then suddenly there was a commotion. You know why there was a commotion? Because that guy on the wheelchair suddenly stood up and started jumping around. Wow, he said, this is amazing. So God heals. Now you need to learn one thing. My friend from South Africa, maybe two years ago, three years ago, he had cancer. He could not heal his own cancer. He died. My whole point is this. The gift of healing is the sovereignty of God. He wants you to heal somebody, he can do it. But if he does not want you to heal somebody, he, that's fine. Is God sovereign? Yes or not? So as we close, I'd like you to notice something. Don't put God in a box. But God is real. So what must we do? When we say align, the analogy is the human body. What do I mean by human body? He talks about the purpose of the gift. Let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 12. One and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Even as the body is one, notice the body is one, and yet has many members. That's the analogy now. You must know your purpose. All the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. The analogy is the church is compared to a human body. The head is Christ, and we are the parts of the body. Look at the next verse. He talks about the next verse. By one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. The day you come to Christ, the Bible tells us God will incorporate you into the spiritual body. You are now part of the body of Christ. That's the meaning of this idea. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. Because of the Holy Spirit, you are now part of the body of Jesus. The body is not one member, but many. The foot says, because I am not a hand, I will not be part of the body. Is it not for this reason any less a part of the body? If the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not part of the body, is it not for this reason any 
the less part of the body. In other words, you cannot pick and choose. Wherever God has placed you, you are part of the body. Don't look down on others. At the same time, don't be jealous of others. Let's read the next verse. The who, if the whole body were an eye, you know, you want to copy, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? Everybody read now. God has placed the members, each one of them, each one of you, in the body as he desired. If they were all one members, where would the body be? But now there are many members, but one body. Are you clear? In other words, God has given us different gifts. The comparison now is you are part of the body of Christ. Each part is needed. We don't have the same function. Look at the next verse. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, or again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. You know what this tells me? Each one is important. Can you tell your neighbor you are important? Learn to appreciate each other. All of you are important in God's kingdom. All of you have a vital role to play. You may think you are a nobody. God says no, you are needed. On the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary, continue reading, and those members of the body which we deem less honorable on those we bestow more abundant honor and our less presentable members become more presentable. Whereas our more presentable members have no need of it, but God has so composed the body to give more abundant honor to that members which lack. In other words, don't feel sad or sorry that you cannot be here every Sunday to speak. Whatever you are doing, God is saying you are important. Look at the next verse. Now this is most important, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. In other words, the purpose of God's gift for you and for me is to bring unity. In the midst of diversity, God is saying you must have unity. And unity is only possible if we understand God is the head, Jesus is the head, we are here to help each other. Somebody wrote a poem, and this poem I hope will speak to you. Let's read this together. He has no hands but our hands to do his work today. He has no feet but our feet to lead men in his way. He has no voice but our voice to tell men how he died. He has no help but our help to lead them to his side. Do you know that you are the body of Christ? Can you turn to your neighbor? Tell your neighbor, you are the body of Christ. Here is the supreme glory of Christians. We are his representative. We are the body of Christ on earth. The greatest impact you can make for Jesus is to connect people to Jesus. The greatest impact you can do in your life, if you ask me, is the opposite of the greatest failure. Do you know what is the greatest failure? When you use God's gift to accomplish your selfish reasons. The greatest tragedy is when you live for yourself, but not for God. So as we close, let me ask you, how do you know your gift? To know your gift, you grow. You have a mindset of a servant. Be part of a small group. Learn to see needs. Look at your heart. What burdens you? What excites you? You see a need, you volunteer. And then you wait for feedback. The final test, you look at the people over you. What do they say about you? You know all D group leaders, raise your hands please, all D group leaders. All D group leaders, it is one of your responsibility to help your members discover their gift. I am very observant of people. I look at their passion, I look at what they do. And I help create ministry opportunities. I provide opportunities for people 
to serve. But the only way you will know your gift, listen to me. Number one, abide. Be dependent on the Holy Spirit. And number two, you need to understand the gift. You got to appropriate God's gift. All of you have a gift. Nothing is too useless. Nothing is too great. Everything is from God. And lastly, you got to align. Align with His purpose. And ask God every day, Lord, how can I accomplish your purpose in my life? Edward Kimball was a simple businessman, but he also volunteered in the church to be a Sunday school teacher. Not knowing what will happen to one of his students. And not knowing what will happen to the students of the student. Edward Kimball was faithful. Do you know the impact of his life? He was able to lead somebody to Christ by the name of Moody. And down the chain, Moody led others to Christ and eventually somebody led Billy Graham to Christ through the chain of lives that were impacted by Edward Kimball. Billy Graham today has reached over two billion people. You know what hit, what hit me? On Judgment Day, God will never compare Edward Kimball to Billy Graham. God will simply ask Edward Kimball, have you been faithful? And God will say, you have been faithful. Have you been faithful? Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord Jesus, today, I surrender my life to you. Instead of living for myself, I now ask you to be my Lord and my Savior. Spirit of the living God, help me to surrender my all. Help me to be obedient to you. And only you can change me. So Jesus, today, I invite you, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Spirit of the living God, fill me with your presence. If that is your prayer, and you pray that prayer right now, I want you to stand up and pray for you. Those of you who pray that prayer right now with your hands raised up, you stand up. I want to pray for you right now. You may ask, why do I ask people to stand up when they pray that prayer? I want you to remember today, this day, you stood up, you gave your life to Jesus, and Jesus knows it, and this day will be an amazing day that will forever change your heart. Lord Jesus, I pray for those people who are standing, how they've given their lives to you. Make it count. Lord Jesus, make their lives count for you. Strengthen them, empower them, and above all, help them know that you are with them. You are not against them. Lord Jesus, I pray for everybody that you want all of us to live a meaningful, purposeful life. I now surrender to you, everybody, those who are watching us in the internet, those who are worshiping with us all over the Philippines. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen, amen. God bless you.